we're in class number 37 in a series that we started uh, just to reflect on, look at, understand God's optic of money. The reason we're doing it is because we, we have a preconceived idea what money is, how money works and why we need it, what, what it does. And there is a functionality to it. But as we said last week, I showed you that little advert that we did on, um, on that uh, medication for um, uh, allergies. And, um, you know, they say, look, at the, you know, this, this, this medication will, will cure your allergies. However, and then they ran through a list of about 50 different side effects, including cancer, death, seizure, the whole lot. And it just says, but, but you know what? Go ahead and get it and take it and live your life. We're thinking, who in their right mind would want to take something with so much risk factor to it? And, you know, since my wife and I, since Lucy and I came here to America, uh, we see that a lot of the advertisements that you have on TV have to disclose the risk factors um, so that you know what you're taking and you know why you have it. When well, money has a risk factor to it, and people don't realize it. They just think, well, you know, that's what everybody in the world does. Money makes the world go round, as we discovered a few weeks ago. That's just the way it is. That's what it does. The systems of this world are governed by a, a fallen, unemployed cherub, and, and then he uses money as the system of enslavement, is really what it is. Um, and, and for those of you who don't understand that, I'm sorry, but it is a, it's a methodology of, of enslavement and what it is what it is. But nonetheless, when you, when you, when you, when you're born into it, bought into it, and we have this passion to get it, to have more of it, because we understand that the systems that are around us are governed by it and are run by it. And that's understandable. Now, God knows that we're here and God knows that we need it, but God wants us to understand before you take this sort of, like in the advert, the medication with all the side effects, you need to know the side effects. So that when you ask God for it, God wants to make sure that you know what you're asking for, you know how it works, why it works the way it does, and that you have the mental capacity and the management skill to be able to handle it. That's all. God's not against you having it, but he is against it having you. God's not against you having a lot of it. He, in fact, in the world in which we live, there's a very uh, potent ability to have influence in this world when you have it. And so... Um, also, his people, if God could get people that he could, uh, that could become a conduit of it for all the right reasons, God would enable and empower his people to hack into a system that is run by it and, and affect it, influence that system. But we've got to wonder for the right reasons, and many times we don't. We come to Christ out of the world in which we are live, live in and are defined by. And when we come to church, we get into this I'll do something for you, God, if you do something for me. And basically what we're asking God to do is give us a better life, prosper us so that we have more money, less debt, and we live a happy life. Jesus said, listen, come here, life's more than this. Life is more than what you're going to put on and what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and where you're going to live. He said, I didn't put you down here to spend your existence created in my image after my likeness and haven't come down to redeem you that you would spend the rest of your life just worrying about your, your address and, and so on and so forth. Come on. I put you down here with far much more, and I can take care of you, but you've got to trust me. And, and so we need to look at money from God's perspective, not our perspective. Many times when we come to church, we end up uh, treating the things of God like a democracy instead of a theocracy. And so, you know, we're told, give God 10%. Well, if I give God 10, then the 90 is mine. None of it's yours. It was never yours. It was always God's. Every cent of it belongs to God. But we have this idea that if I give my portion to God, the rest is mine. And we have this misunderstanding of lordship. Lordship means God owns everything. And so we come to God many times on the money factor with a different optic than God. And so again, it's, it's not that you can't have it. It's not that God doesn't want to give it to you, but he wants you to understand what it is and why you, you need it, and what, for what purpose. And we're going to look at that in the, next, in the next few weeks. So, I told you really, when it all boils down to it, there's two systems on the planet. And there's the, the, the one operated by God, which is the theocracy, and the, the, the 
the factor that motivates and, and runs God's system is the blessing, period. That's how it works. Uh, the blessing is operated by faith, by believing that you are and believing that it is, um, and that trusting that God has done what God has done and Jesus has accomplished what needed to be done. And then we put faith in Jesus, not faith in our bartering, faith in our performance, faith in our smartness. No, it's just faith in Jesus Christ, period, that he done enough and he did it all. Then the other system, of course, is the system that operates by money, which is the world systems around us. You can see what's going on in the world today with the SWIFT system and all of these different things, closing people out, shutting people down, fiat currencies and all sorts of stuff. Um, you saw what happened you know, north of the border there where they can just go in and take your money, shut you down, take your stuff. Um, you know, it really is very uh, shaky material. And yet many times our whole lives revolve around it. And it shouldn't be. We should seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all this other stuff will come to us, but it will come in a fashion that nobody can take it from you. It's, it's different when God gives it to you. When God gives it to you, nobody can take it. If you've earned it your way, then you keep it your way. I always say this. What you start in the flesh, you have to maintain in the flesh. What you st start and do in the spirit is maintained by the spirit. It's just it's a different world altogether. So there's these two systems. And if we were to ask God to... You know, what would God's optic be of money? That's God's optic of money. It's very dangerous, very manipulative, very controlling. Um, and it's, it's fierce. It's a fierce thing. Um, and you can see how many people will kill for it or steal for it or change their personality or lose family and friends for it. It's, 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 it's a very dangerous element in the world in which we live, and yet the world revolves around it, its mechanism. So let me remind you of a few things as we run through here, and I'll just recap them quickly, and that is that money, you know, when Jesus is teaching on this, and I put a few different verses there, just to highlight some of the things that money basically says of itself. You, you can't serve two masters. Money wants to master you as much as God does. Money does. Um, further down, I put the green one. You cannot serve God and be enslaved by money. God wants you to serve, to, you know, and, and that's where you have a willingness to do that. But enslavement's a different thing. You really are not in control anymore. It's in control of you. And then you can't worship two gods at once. So it wants to be worshipped. And so I put up there money. You know, I will master and enslave you and you will worship and serve me. That's really what it says. That's really what it wants, to take the place of God in your life and enslave and master your life. And, and we, we took this, this up too. And you cannot trust in uncertain riches. There is no certainty to it. I asked them in Canada. There is no certainty to it. I asked them in Russia this morning. There is no certainty to any of it. You can look at it and think, I've got loads of it, I'm secure, I'm stable, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be all right, and tomorrow it's all gone. It's not stable. It's not stable at all. You're not secure. It's a false level of security if you think that your tomorrows are okay. It, 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 it's just not reliable. It, it says here, sorry, I thought somebody... Um, which is, another version says, which is so unreliable. You can't rely on it. You just can't rely on it. It's uncertain. It's unreliable. It's, or another version says, which is here today, gone tomorrow. And even if it's not taken from you, how many of us have, you know, at some time accumulated or acquired uh, maybe a, a larger amount than we would have been used to or whatever, and to think, hey, this is it, I'm comfortable, everything's going to be good, everything's all right, only to find out that, you know, a month or so later, or a few months later, by the end of the year, it's all gone again. You think, oh my goodness, I've got to go get that again. Because it actually, you can't hold on to it, you really can't, and, and I'll show you why. So, again, uncertain, unreliable, here today, gone tomorrow, wants to master you, wants to enslave you, wants you to serve it, wants you to worship it. In Proverbs 27, verse 24, it says, For riches are not forever. And, and you can't pass the crown to the next generation to, and think for sure that that's the way it's going to be just because it's your intention. That's basically what he's saying. He says, as much and all as you want to pass it on or think that it'll be here tomorrow, you, you can't guarantee. You can't guarantee what your kids and your kids' kids are going to do. And you can't guarantee 
that your riches that you have today will be adequate tomorrow. You see, you just can't. It's unstable. It's uncertain. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure it's not a glitch in your program or your algorithm? Yeah. So how many times how many times did you put it through the same system again go, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. That's what it does. And you're right, just a, a percentage of something. Uh, it's, and it just dwindles over time. It just it it takes it on you steals it on you is what it does and so there's this false level of security and um, so they're not forever and um, so remember that in in a pro yes oh what happened here oh the joys of technology let me try this again It doesn't want to do it. Let me try this again. That's, I'm going to just check here now. See, did my system shut down? It did. And let's get back into it from here. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. All right, so uncertain, unreliable, uh, they don't last forever. It says here in Proverbs 23 and 4, it says, labor not to be rich. And what that means is, it's not that, you, you, that he doesn't want you to be rich, but he doesn't want you to spend all of your time every day in the pursuit of it. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. He says, love not to be rich, cease not from your own wisdom. Wilt thou set your eyes upon that which is not, for riches certainly make themselves wings and they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it's gone. I had it, I had it, now there it goes. Such, such and such once that I got a bill from this, a bill from that, a requirement here, a, a commitment there, and before you know it, it's just like, where did it go? It just, it's gone. Or it says in another version in 23.4, don't wear yourself out, and that's what happens to us. We wear ourselves out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Understand how it works. Don't be driven by the pursuit of it. There's so many other things far more valuable and there's so much more wealth in life than money. Your family, your marriage, your health, your spirituality, your peace of mind, your joy. There are so many things that money truly can't buy. I used to say this you know, years ago when I preached it in, in, in Ireland and places and I used to say, well, you know, it just doesn't bring peace. And, and, and one particular guy used to say, Albert Pastor, it would really help. <laughs> so I say, okay, all right. So don't wear yourself out trying to get it. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, it just disappears. For it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. So it's just, it's very, very important that we understand what it is and what it does. It, it's, it, it is there. You, you, you can have it, you can acquire it, you think there's a stability and a security to it, but don't be deceived by it. Because it's not as secure and it's not as stable and it's not as certain as they want you to think it is. It changes all the time. Um, and for me, that's God's business optic of money. Um, it's, it's a life among sharks. It's, it, it, it can consume you and devour you and destroy you. It's, it's just a dangerous place to be. And before you ask God for it, remember, this is the way God sees it. So it's like a kid coming to his dad saying, Dad, can I have a shotgun? He says, son, you're only four. He says, yeah, but I promise I won't. You know, I'll be careful. He says, well, you know what? I, I believe that you will grow up to be careful, but at this juncture, no. It's too dangerous. Many times we come to God and say, hey, that, you know, I want to swim with the sharks. He said, no. He said, you know, well, they're just big fish. Well, they are big fish, but you know what? And they're very dangerous. Hey, God, I want more money. I, I want you to have more money, but 
until you renew your thinking to what it is and how it works and why it is the way it is and your your motivation for it i really can't give it to you yet you're just not ready to to dive in there that's all it is that's all we're talking about god's perspective of this so proverbs 10 15 it says a rich man's wealth is his strong city it's amazing how secure we get in life by the thought i wonder how many and, and again, I'm just re relating to what we're watching unfolding on TV. In, in Ukraine this morning, where their money really doesn't make a difference at this moment in time. They can lose everything. Their home, their family, their business, their joy, their peace, their life. And all that they saved up for, the address that they long to live in, the business they struggle to acquire, somebody can take it out this morning. In a moment, it's gone. It's just so unstable. And it's not that you shouldn't have those things and it's not that God doesn't want to give you those things. It's just God wants you to have your mind in the right place and he will give it to you. And the thing about it is when he does, nobody can touch it. Amen. Nobody can take it from you when God gives it to you. It's just a different place because you know where you got it from. Now when you know where you got it from, it's easy to be the channel of it. It's easy to be the conduit of it. It's easy to be blessed and then be a blessing because you know where it's coming from. It's, it it's, comes from a different place. Same stuff, just coming from a different source. But I'll show you how that works. So it says, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is poverty. Or another verse says, he that trusted in his riches shall fall. You just can't trust it. And that's all he's saying. He didn't say you shouldn't have it. He just said, if you put your trust in it, It'll let you down. It will let you down. Um, and, and how many of us, and how many stories, and how many people do we know that used to be, used to have, uh, and used to whatever, and that aren't, or isn't, or don't today? I mean, the story goes over and over again. Oh, so see, they used to live, now they're living under a bridge over there. Or, you know, they meet over here and you know what? They had to change the dress or they had to leave that company. That corporation closed down or everything went south in 2008. And now, you know what? Things are going south now. At the moment. <gasps> you, know, what, you know, COVID shut, you know, where, where do you rent space? Who needs a building now when everybody's working from home? What do you do if you've got all this property and all your money invested in it and nobody wants to rent? I mean, it just goes a million different ways. God sees all of this before it ever comes. God will put you in the right position. I mean, I would love to if, if, if that's the way things went. And I don't know that it did, so don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm not an expert in these. But, you know, I know a lot of people aren't going back to their corporation buildings or whatever. People are working from home or remotely. And, uh, you know, for people that had, you know, 12,000 square feet or 20,000 square feet or 60,000 square feet and they rented it out for office space. And since COVID, they don't need it anymore. And it's, an, it's a burden uh, of expense as they try to rebuild the, the business. Um, I would love to have been, to know in advance that something was going to happen and be able to fob that off and get rid of it before it never happened so that I would not be at a loss. Um, God has a wonderful way of letting you know in advance what's happening uh, so that you become very, very clever as to what's going on around you. God can give you wisdom and this is a subject we'll probably take up straight after this series because it's wisdom that makes you wealthy and we'll talk about it. In Ecclesiastes 4, 8, um, it says, there is one alone and there is not a second, or somebody on their own, they're, 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 they labor for themselves, all right? Gifted, talented. It says, there is one alone, there is not a second. Yet he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with what he has achieved or what he has accumulated or what he has done. It says, neither says he, for whom do I labor? And bereave my soul of good. This is a vanity. Yeah, this is a sore travail. He says, I've watched people, Solomon said, and all they've done is work, 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 work. They, they, you know, they don't have neither chick nor child, as they say in Ireland. They don't have nobody to give it to. But they're driven by this ethic of, of acquisition, of of resources and sources and they just keep acquiring acquiring, and it drives them they just have nobody else to work for or live for and yet they're driven so why would you do that why, why would you drive your life you know working for a company or a corporation 
when you've really nobody to pass it on to or, 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 or enjoy the benefits. I mean, if, if others are enjoying the benefits of what you do, I can understand you wanting to give them more and do more for them. There's nothing wrong with that. But he said, here's a vanity I've seen in life. People are just driven. And he says, they don't even have anything to be driven for. Just this thing gets a hold of you and it'll drive you. You know, hey, I've done a business. You know what, maybe I should do two of them. I mean, I was very successful here in Alpharetta, very successful, you know, in Johns Creek. You know, maybe we'll put another six out there too. I mean, and then you start to stretch yourself out. And it's not that, I remember the time when we prayed and thought, Lord, if you'll just make this one great, I'll be happy. Well, I mean, if you make this one great and the one in Johns Creek, I'll be really, really happy. Well, if you make the one in Duluth and in Johns Creek and here, and if we go over to Marietta and we could just do another one, I mean, we'd really, really be happy. And so you start to extend yourself out. And now you're living way beyond not living beyond, but your aspirations are way beyond what you were happy with in the beginning. You say, well, what got a hold of me? Just more. Just want more. I need more. I, I, I do more now, and I play more, and I need more. And so all of a sudden, it's not because you thought if I had that first one, I'd be happy and meet the needs, send the kids to college. I'd be able to do what I do. It's, it's, I'm, I'm able to cope with it, the pressure of it. And you know what? Hey, it's a success. And then we just push all of that success into the next investment, into the next one, and everything we thought we were in, in doing it all for the kids, we, we keep risking it with the next venture and the next venture, and really what we're putting is that dream that was original at risk by kicking it out. But what's kicking it out? It's just we're, we get driven by the whole process. Everybody with me? All right. And so he says, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. There's just something about it where, when's enough? When is enough? Yes or no? I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, part of a certain denomination. And we, the church, especially in the season that we're in right now, to the example that you just mentioned, are suffering because of that. We got so caught up and acquiring uh, first it was let's have a place where we could fellowship or worship then boy if we could do something that we can nurture our youth or our kids or what have you we need to expand and then afterwards you end up buying such a large edifice or uh, you start buying this church this stadium this building and when the pandemic came Everybody was home. Now, you're in a paradigm between trying to build the church, which is the individuals, mm -hmm. and now figuring out what you're going to do with all these, all this real estate that is, you know, and even having a decline in folks in, in, in Christianity and people attend the church. Mm -hmm. Now you are uh, burdened with trying to figure out what you're going to do with all this real estate. So now, are you really a church or are you a real estate developer <laughs> yeah. trying to figure out what's going on because you lost sight of mm. the church, which is the mm. individuals. Yeah, and I, I know what that's like. I, I, in, in Ireland, one of the aspirations of any ministry was to acquire our own place. Uh, all these other denominations, the, the ones that have been around for a long, long time, they had all their edifices everywhere. And, and the only sign of stability we would have had in planting a church was to have our own building. Yep. We could never afford it. By the time we tried to pay for the staff and pay our own bills and pay for the rent and the lease and whatever and pay the insurance, and it was just, and, and you end up then what you do is you're generating, trying to generate money all the time is, is what you're trying to do. And then when you try to generate money, then you start to pull any scripture you can out of the scriptures to try and coerce people to believe that this is the way God wants you to do it. And it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. And so there is a way of doing it. And God, God wants, to, wants us to understand that. So you're never going to be satisfied. Just never. Even if you've got enough to sustain you and put in your retirement fund and think, well, I'm happy, and then the interest rate goes up, and then all of a sudden, you know, the shark's stuck another batch of it, and you think, God, I've, where is it gone? Okay. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. The labor of man is for his mouth, but his appetite's never filled. 
So if, if that's what you're laboring for alone, if that's the, the goal, you're never going to be satisfied. You'll always have to keep this going. You're always going to, you're going to be on the treadmill of it, is really what it's saying. It, 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 labor is like a treadmill. And, and, and the, the longer you're on it, and the, the, you get more things and bigger things and better things, and it requires that you spend longer or get a bigger treadmill or a bigger productive treadmill. But it, it gets you on it. And once you get on it, it's hard to get off of it, is all it's saying. It's just your, the appetite's never satisfied. So you start with the little treadmill, now you have to get a bigger treadmill, now you've got to get a bigger, bigger treadmill. And the thing about it is you're never off of it. You're just on it. You're just, you, you get on it and it's hard to get off of it. And God said, I don't want you to spend your life on a treadmill trying to satisfy something that can't be satisfied. And that's all he's saying. He's not against you having it. He's not against you having a lot of it. He's not against you using it correctly and having it for all the right reasons. And in fact, he'll give it to you if you understand what it's for, how it works, and how to use it. He'll give it to you. And when he gives it to you, nobody can take it. We'll talk about it. Ecclesiastes 5.10 He that loveth silver never be happy. Not that there's anything wrong with silver. You say, well, I, you, know, you need to love gold instead. No, that's not what he's saying. All right? He's just saying, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied. Did you know when Solomon, who wrote this, was king, what was the value of silver? Nothing. Nothing. It was in heaps around the city of Jerusalem. Heaps. There was mountains of it, mounds of it, because it had no value. None. There was so much of it. There was no, he had no value. People had given it to him as gifts. There was so much silver, it, just, it was outside in, in heaps, and it had no value at all. None. And he's saying, look at it. He that loveth silver, you'll never be satisfied. There's never enough of it. You'll never be satisfied with silver. You may start with silver, but then it's, can I get something else? Nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also a vanity. This is the treadmill. What's enough? If I were to ask you to, 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 to take out a pen and paper and write down what's enough. <laughs> well, the reality is you don't have it tomorrow and you don't have a lot of different things for sure, but we, we set our standards because that, that, that enough is what drives us. That's why we go to work today and it's why we you know, look for, you know, to plan for tomorrow and pay this and save that because we, we have a sort of a limit. How many of us have ever changed our limits? And how many times have we changed our limits? And when do we change our limits? I'll tell you when you change your limit when you arrive at the, at the aspiration of the last one. And as soon as you arrive at the aspiration and the fulfillment of the last one, the first thing you do is set a new one. Nothing's anything wrong with that. It's just, please understand, it, it's, it's the treadmill. It's how it works. And the thing God's going to try and show us is, look, please understand what it does to you. Please understand what happens when you put yourself in this cycle, it, it, it drives you, it masters you, it controls you. Your time, which is the most valuable thing you have, it'll consume it. It'll take it, it'll take it away from your family, it'll destroy your health. You just got to watch what it does. It is, you know, as I said, take the little, you know, um, a little histamine, it's fine. Oh, by the way, all the side effects. Hey, listen, by all means, go get it. Please remember there's side effects to this. That's all. Just be aware of what's going on. Be in control of it, not it in control of you. That's all he's trying to get us to understand. So, he who loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor those who love abundance. You, you, no matter how much increase you get, it'll never be suffice. It'll never be enough. I, I just wrote there, more, more, more. It's just the way it works. It's just, this, it's just the system. Ecclesiastes 5.11 I love this part. I put it in a few different versions here. It says, when goods increase, and let's believe God for all of us that they will. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. I'll explain it now. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving them to just watch it happen with their eyes? Or well, let me explain it from another version. A few versions here. 
The more loot you get, the more looters show up. And what fun is it to be robbed in broad daylight? I mean, come on. Did you know sometimes people couldn't care less who you are until you start to acquire or accumulate or go up in the world and then everybody wants to be your friend? You often hear them say, you know, when you have plenty of money, you have plenty of friends. When you have no money, you have no friends. <laughs> yeah. And you gather friends when you got money. But here's what he says. Solomon and Solomon was the richest man that ever lived. Solomon said, I have watched, the more money I get, the more people I find around me that want to help me spend it. And, and they do, and they're brilliant at it. And they find all the projects I need to be invested in and all the things I need to be doing and all the things that God told them to tell me that I need to do. And, and, and you'll find there's not hardly any of them that are not not worthy causes or not this or not that. I mean, there's a lot of need out there in the world. I always say there's something to remember. I can do all things through Christ, but I can't do everything. Please remember that. I can do all things that God asked me to do. I can do all things through Christ, but I can't do everything. That's for others to do. You only do what you can do. But you can't do everything. But he says here, you know, the more loot you get, the more looters show up. Or another version says, well, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? I mean, you end up with so much, all he can do is look at it anyway. He's got two of these and four of them and five of that. And then he says, and then these other guys come along and they will spend their lives trying to take from you what you've got. So you'll have all sorts of new friends. You don't even notice it anymore. You don't even notice it anymore. And, and, and then you acquire. How many, how, many, you know, how many things can you have? He says there'll come a stage when really all you, you, you have so much that all you now do is look at them. He says when you're at that stage, he says, wow, you've really been... You say, oh, that's a great... I'd love to be like that. I'd love to, I'd love to have and be at that place. There, there's, there's a responsibility that goes with all of this stuff. I, I don't know if it's worth getting for what you might have to lose to get it. That's really what he's going to say. Just watch it. it it's, it's consumed. And you'll find the one or two, you know, I, I remember years ago in the, there was an Amway system going on in, in Ireland. And the reason I was aware of it is because people used to use the church as a, as a connect. I had to stop it. I told him, hey, listen, guys, you want to do business, you do business out there, and here we're doing God's business, period. And if people here are just another, an, a, another uh, connect for you to, to add to your pyramid, um, you're out. I'm not having that. We're not doing that. That's not what we're here for. And yet people would come in and prey on everybody that was new. Hey, how you doing? Listen, I sell detergent. Would you like to join my little group? And you can buy detergent off me, and then the, you, know, you know the whole pyramid scenario. Um, and, you know, and, and people do this, they, 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 they use church or they use whatever, and, and they, they, they're just using it for their advancement. He says, you've got to watch. God wants to advance you, but you've got to watch who starts to gravitate to you, because they're, they're out to spend it for you. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. That's all he says in the last one. So, God's optic of money. So he sees it. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous, very controlling, very manipulative, very driven. You'll never be satisfied with it. It's not your standard. If, if that's what you're going to live for, then I'm sorry. You're just never going to have enough of it. You're never going to come to a place where you're content. You're never going to come to a place where you're satisfied. There'll always be that inkling of thinking, I can do more, achieve more, acquire more, accomplish more. And, and there's nothing wrong with the drive of wanting to be your best self and, and do the most you can do and be the best you can be. But, but you can do that, but you've got to understand, don't let that be the driving force of it. Let your purpose be the driving force of who you are and what you do. And I, I promise you, if you do your purpose and be yourself, your purpose will draw resources. That's another subject for another time. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet whether he, he eats little or much. But the abundance of the rich 
will not suffer him to sleep. By the time he sets all the alarms, by the time he locks the gates and sets out the dogs and locks the safe and shuts the thing and turns on the outside lights and informs the other crowd that he's gone and, and makes sure that the police got paid to call around every 30 minutes and pass the property and, and, um, and the, check their screens to make sure that their, um, their shares are still there. Uh, and that nobody has hacked the system and stolen half of it from them and that the bank's given them the interest that they're due because you know it's their money and they said whatever and now they're charging me fees for looking at it I mean come on I mean uh, and and they lie in bed at night looking up at the ceiling thinking who's trying to take my money he says the labor man on the other hand you can hear him snoring in the other room because you know he just done his best worked hard lives his life Loves his family, does whatever. I'm not saying a fellow with money doesn't love his family. Don't get me right. I mean, I may have said that wrong, but you understand what I'm saying. He's just saying there's some that don't have that level of responsibility. There's a responsibility comes with it, and it'll consume you. It'll worry you. It'll cause anxiety and sleepless nights. It can just be like that from time to time, and that's all he's saying. But the abundance of the rich, rich, will not suffer him to sleep. It says it this way, here is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. I, I remember, um, I'm just trying to think of whose name was. Uh, he was a very famous actor. And, uh, was it an actor? Was it, oh gosh, an actor or singer. No, no, it's just been a while since I, I brought this up as an illustration. But um, he became so famous that he, he used to, if he wanted a hamburger or something, he'd have to send somebody from his hotel or whatever to get it. Because he couldn't go on the street. Because everybody knew who he was and he'd be swamped by paparazzi or swamped by you know, people looking for autographs and whatever. And in an interview in a hotel room, he was asked, with, you know, with your acquisition of money, what, what would you, you know, what, what, look what you have, what would you like to buy? He said, I'd like to buy the freedom of being able to do what I used to do before I was famous. He says, because I can't live life anymore. I can't go on the street. I've got to have bodyguards. I've got to have protection. I've got to let people know in advance. I've become a celebrity and I've become enslaved by my fans. Totally enslaved. He said, I wish I could walk down the street. I wish I could go for a hamburger. I wish I could just do ordinary life. If I, had, I, if I could give all this away to get that back, that's what I'd do. That's what Elvis done. Elvis is in Texas, pumping gas. That's where Michael Jackson is. <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> my, my, my wife would love to think that Elvis is living in Texas. <laughs> now, anyway, so, and, and a lot of times people think, maybe that's what they've done. Maybe they just, maybe they just wanted out. Maybe they just wanted away from it. Maybe they just couldn't stick it any longer and thought, I want to go back to life. And you, you go to Argentina and, you know, there's Prince. You know what I'm saying? So I thought he, I thought he, well, everybody did, but... You don't know, it just, it, it's a rat race. And, and they get there and then they realize it's not everything. It's like the people who acquire and accumulate and, and then you know something goes wrong and, and you hear that they leapt from a building and you think, what was that all about? I mean, you were at the pinnacle of your success and the pinnacle of your acquisition and everybody wanted to be like you, but you didn't realize if you knew what he was like, you wouldn't want to be like him. God says, look at this stuff is so lethal and so dangerous and so driving and so enslaving and so mastering. You've got to know what you're dealing with. Educate yourself on it. See it the way I see it. Understand what it does, how it does it, and then I'll put you in the control seat and I'll be, I'll be able to do with you and through you what others can't do that have it in the other regime. And you become really smart and clever with it and use it for all the right reasons. Um, 
It says here, I've seen a grievous uh, evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. You know, it's, it's hard lines when you have to get protection for your kids going to school. Hard lines when, you know, your children are now at risk because somebody wants what you have. And instead of going after you for it or, or doing business and competing with you, they decide the easy way to do it is just take your kids. And it happens all the time. So don't kid yourself. I'm not talking about anything that's strange. One of the biggest industries in Mexico is kidnapping. It's people who don't want to earn it. So they decide, you know what, take your kids. Who wants? That's not fair on your kids. You get so much that your kids are in danger. Your whole family's in danger. But that's what this stuff does. It drives people. So it says here, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners or wealth lost through some misfortune. So then when you have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. The Bible's going to talk to us in, in a few weeks' time about leaving your children's children an inheritance. A good man leaves his kids and his grandchildren something. Don't leave your children and your grandchildren debt. Don't leave them debt. You can leave them an abundance. And, and you should think generationally, but as you say, well, you're after saying money doesn't do this and money doesn't, and it's uncertain. And yes, it is. But you see when God's in it, you get to leave your children's children an inheritance. You should think generationally when it comes to money. Um, there is another serious problem I've seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. And money put into risky investments that turn sour. Everything's lost. In the end, there's nothing left to pass to one's children. So you just got to watch this stuff. Really can be, you can lose it all real quickly. It just, it's like water in your hands. It passes real quick. Matthew 13, 22, Jesus, as he's teaching, says this. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. These are believers. They hear the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. It's deceitful. It'll tell you one thing and do another. It'll tell you this is what, you know, and you're blessed and you're na na na. And really what it's trying to do is, 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 is pull you away from. I've seen a lot of people over the years that have asked God to bless them and felt God did. And then you never see them in church again. God didn't bless you to cause you to leave. God didn't bless you for you to take off. It says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But it, it happens. Yes, sir. Yeah, the context there as well is about this is what the kingdom of God is like. You can talk about the kingdom. Mm. The implication is wealth or the love of wealth can rob us from living the kingdom, from, from enjoying the kingdom. Absolutely. That other, that what we were doing up to now was just generalistic. This is the way it works in the world. Here's what it does to people who have the word. It can actually get in there and, and choke everything that is true about the word. Everything that's true about your salvation. Everything that's true about the purpose for your life and so on and so forth. After a while, you actually are now doing church on the treadmill of acquisition. Now you're rubbing the lamp and using the name of Jesus, not to serve Jesus, so, but to Jesus will serve you. And serve your aspirations and, and desires. And we've gone from lordship to ownership. It's just a different quality of life. Am I doing okay? He's all right. Don't look so sad. He'll be fine. <laughs> He'll be fine. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I mean, God, I don't want it. And, and I, I, at the end of this, he's going to ask us all to empty our water. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to help you to understand what you have in your pocket. Correct. You get your eyes off of the source. The yeah. Or the resource. You get your eyes off the source and you look at the resource. And, you know, you get your eyes off the blessor and you start looking at the blessings. 
Uh, keep your eyes on the blessor. Uh, keep your eye on, on, the, on, on the source. Um, and, and understand that everything else is a resource. That's all it is. That's all it is. Use it wisely. God will show you what to do with it. And if he gives it to you, he'll certainly he'll get involved with you in it. And, and it's, 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 it's a wonderment when you see God getting involved in it and doing what he does. The deceitfulness. And I highlighted deceitfulness because deceit is it tells you one thing and does another. Well, you know what? I praise the Lord. I believe the Lord's going. You can say that all you want and you can use that vernacular all you want. If you don't understand how this stuff works, even as a believer, this stuff will consume you. It'll drive you. And then you'll end up using church, as I said, with my Amway crowd or whatever. You're starting to use church as a platform for advancing yourself. That's all it is. Who can I meet with? Go to great church. A lot of great people at it. Love to mix. Got to mix. You got to connect. But you're not connecting for the sake of promoting or advancing. You're connecting because you think it'll advance your business. And so on and so forth. And I'm not saying you can't connect. I'm not saying you shouldn't connect. So don't get me wrong. I'm just saying motivation becomes everything. When you get around people that, that you know, that do well, you, you've got to watch your own motivation. Yes, sir? I'm sure you have it in one slide, but everything that you're saying just keeps ringing in my mind. The interaction that Jesus had with the rich young ruler who, man, I want to serve you. He's mm. talking to the word. Mm. The word said, okay, uh, follow me, but you got to leave all that stuff behind. Mm. And he just couldn't do it. Yeah. We will get to it. It is an example of uh, God prospering people. And, the, and the, the most important thing in your life is purpose. That rich young ruler was called to be an apostle. He got a call, same way as he went to Matthew, same way he was a tax collector, same as he went to the other guys in the marketplace and called them to serve him. He came to this guy that had so much. And, and, and he says, Lord, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And he's saying, well, you can't inherit it. He says, well, you called me Lord, and you said that's right. He says, so tell me, what does the scripture say? Mm -hmm. Oh, he says, well, you know, the scriptures say don't do this and don't do that and do do this and do do that. And Jesus says, and? And he says, but I've done that from when I was a kid. He goes, that's why you're a rich young ruler. Because you've obeyed the word of God. It's prospered you. But you know what? Your calling's higher than this. So I'll tell you what. Why don't you just come follow me? And I'll tell you what to do. Let's start on a whole different level. Take everything you've got. Give it to the poor. Now, if he was a guy who understood the word, the scripture say in Proverbs, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. You never lose it. When you give money to the poor, you're lending to God. You're, God's using you to help them. But it's yours. You'll get that back. You'll always get it back. The scriptures say, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. And Jesus is looking at this guy who says, well, I keep the word all the time. He goes, great, great. Sell it all, give it to the poor, because you'll get it back. And then come on and follow me. I've got a higher call and a purpose for your life. And I can give you all that again. In fact, I can give you a lot more than that. And he walked away. And, and the Bible says Jesus was sorrowful. And then the disciples looked at Jesus and said, what about us? We're after giving up mothers, fathers, lands, houses, business, the whole lot to follow you. And, and you know, what happens? Because Jesus made the statement. He says, it's easier, guys, for a camel to come through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. He didn't say it was impossible. That's not what he said. He didn't say rich people can't enter the kingdom. He never said that at all. He said, but do you realize how difficult it is for them to follow me when they're on the treadmill of life and all this stuff is going on and their security or trust is in it? And again, and for those who maybe didn't understand, the eye of a needle, there's a big gate, and then there's a wicked gate, a little small gate, in the big gate. And at night they used to close the gates of all the city, because you, you, you know nightlight, you know street lights. So at night you would close the gates of the city, and anybody who approached the city after dark would have to come to the closed gates. And if they wanted to come in and the guy on the wall said, you know, what's your business? And they say, I'm looking for a place. He said, fine. So they'd go down, but they would never open the big gates. They'd open a wicked gate, which was a small gate. And they'd open the wicked gate. 
And so if you were traveling from one city to the next, you had your suitcases or your camel or whatever, and where camel was laden with your stuff, he says, so here's what you had to do. You had to offload your camel. You had to take your camel through the, the wicked gate on his knees, because he had to get down and he had to inch his way through. You had to pull your camel through the gate and then you had to go back or take your stuff through the gate and reload your camel. That's all. He said, this guy didn't understand what I just asked him. All I asked him to do was just come through the gate with me. Drop your stuff on the far side. Come on through. And I've got so much more for you on the far side. More than you've dropped on that side. Just give that to the poor. That's lending to the Lord. Come on through with me. And then, and then the disciples say, so what about us? We've given up everything. He says, no man that has ever given up mothers, fathers, brothers, lands, houses for my sake or for the gospel or for the kingdom. But will in this life receive a hundredfold with persecution. Don't forget that. <laughs> Okay, that's part of it read the small print read the side effects with persecution if you're going to ask God for it you're going to get persecuted when you get it comes with it you've got to have the backbone for it you've got to understand what you're using it for and he says and that's what that whole discourse was about that's what it was all about hey if, if, I, if I ask you to do something, then do what I ask you to do. Drop it. Come on through. Come on, just come with me because I can give you far more where I'm taking you than what I'm asking you to leave. God will never ask you to leave something without taking you to a better place in him. But you've got to trust me. And he says, that's how hard it is. It's really, really hard for somebody to drop everything and come to another level with me because they end up trusting the level they're at. And he says, just come with me. I'd take them to a place that is far better than where I'm asking them to leave. That's all. Yeah. Isn't this like maybe the most powerful example of, you say the Bible is a law book. That story is the law of reciprocity. You give without any question whatsoever, you come back to you tenfold. You might not know how, but I mean, you have to give to the faith. You have to give everything you have faithfully without any condition. And then Jesus is saying, you have no idea what I'm going to give you back if you give me what I'm asking you to give me. Well, let, me qual let me qualify your statement. Your statement is absolutely right. Give when God tells you to give. Right. To who God tells you to give it. When God tells you to give it. But this idea of just giving. Not like give to the church 10%. That's, that's different, right? Completely different. But you, you just clarified that. That's great. Yeah. Let me just say this. This is a, it is a very open-ended statement. I will qualify it in the next series that we're going to do on wisdom. All right? 2023? Maybe. <laughs> um, the, truth of, the truth of giving is give up. You give up. And, or, no, let me put it this way. I'll, I'll, I'll change my words here. You sew up and you give down. Yeah, well, you're sewing up. You sew up and you give down. You give down. When you're giving down, it's because you're giving to people with less. When you sew, you sew into something that's bigger than yourself. You sew up, you give down. It's, it's a principle. And uh, you have to be very clever when you do it. And God, so it's not a and, and, and God will very seldom ask you for everything that he's given you. Just... So in case everyone's afraid, well, you know, if I follow God, God's going to ask me to give everything away. No. When you get to that place where you can trust God, he may ask you to drop everything and walk away from it. But it's the most exciting life you can ever live is to drop everything and follow God. You know, there's nothing like it. There's, it's, it's the most exciting life you can ever live is to follow God. Yes? So is there a tag on to that that we were to give cheerfully? So in other words, if we're doing it out of um, 
fear, or we're doing it under the law almost. Uh-huh. That's right. And so if you're giving it because you're afraid, if you don't give it, you know, God's not going to do it for me. You're giving for the wrong reason. You don't understand what you're doing. And, and we're trying to coerce people to try and give. And that's what, where we've come. Here's, here's, what, here's the truth. It's easy to know when people know they're blessed. Do you know why? When you know where it's coming from and, and you're blessed, it's so easy to be a blessing because you know the resource, the source and the resource, the source and the resource, source, resource, source, resource. And it's no, then you become a conduit of it. People say they're blessed and you know they're not. They, they have been, but they don't get it yet. They don't understand what they have. They don't understand how it works because they want to be blessed. That's why Paul said in the book of Acts in chapter 20, quoting Jesus, he says, for you have heard it said, and this is verse 37, Jesus said, it is more blessed to what? Yes. What? The best end of the equation is to be the giver, not the receiver. You say, oh, but I'd love to receive. Who wouldn't? But the truth of the matter is the better end of that equation is the giver, not the, not the receiver. He says, You're, you want to be on the giving end. You don't want to be on the receiving end. You want to be the conduit, not the conduit too, in, in the sense of what it flows out. You want to be the, the flow. Yes, sir. So, No, it wasn't a bicycle. It was the insurance for a car. But I, I, I couldn't drive the car because I didn't have the insurance, but I went on a bicycle, which is all I had, to give it away. And I did that, I did that a few times. Yeah. That's right. And I only needed 500 pounds is all I needed. But within, in a three-week period, 1,200 pounds came through my hands and five, the last five I kept, but the others, every time I got it, God told me to give it away. But it, it, it just works. But let me, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. You're right. I, I just, <clears throat> as you have been since I've joined these Tuesday meetings, um, as you're speaking and teaching, um, I'm getting other impartation as well. And as we're talking right now, the difference between the rich young ruler versus, which we don't know his name, uh, who I call a generator, and Solomon, who only asked for wisdom, and that God exceedingly blessed. Um, then there's us as men, the rich young ruler Solomon, um, we get stuck between us who are business owners and those things who are generators and visionaries and create our wealth or what sustains us and those who have wisdom. But at some point in time, as you've been teaching today, once we start amassing and accumulating and acquiring, we get into our own humanity and don't do the cycle as you're talking about right now, which is... If you're blessed, which we all are, to be a blessing, we get stuck at that point that we don't realize as you sow, you should give in order to have increase. The other scriptures say he continues to prune us so we can bear more fruit. And that's the problem, and that's the issue that we have as men. Yeah. And not just that, even, even as you start to apply these concepts and principles to your life, and God starts to interject with the wisdom that you need to get it and acquire it, then what happens is, you know, God's accumulating stuff to you, to flow through you, and then you get 10 or 20 people coming along and say, hey, listen, I want you to invest in this or invest in that. And before you know it, what God was trying to get to somebody else, somebody else came and took it. Yeah. God, somebody else is using it. It's down, down the street on, on something else, but it might pay off in 10 years. Well, God, God can give you more than that in, in 10 days. 
but God was accumulating that for something else. But no, that's what he said. The more you get, the more people will come and try and get you to use it for other things. It's, it's just, it's, it's an intimate walk with God. I'd be walking with God in this. Yes, sir. I just want to highlight the most important concept you're talking about, though, is that spirit-led concept. Mm. If God tells you to do it, you do it. Yes. That's the part that people struggle with, yeah. right? I mean, you have to be in relationship with him to hear Correct. what he's telling you to do. And do it. <laughs> and do it, yeah. But I'm just saying, I mean, no, you're right. many people just ask, like, how do I know if I'm in God's will? Well, you got to listen. Yeah. He'll tell you. And, and, and I think somebody asked last week, you know, how do I know? How, how can I know it's God? Peace. Absolute peace. When you know, when, you walk, when, when he tells you to do something, you know it's him that told you to do it, you can, you can part with anything because you know where it comes from. It's easy. Just easy. It's easy to do it. It's not hard. It's not hard. And... Um, let me, let me read a couple more verses here and we'll, we'll set you up for next week. Is everybody okay? Everybody all right? All right. Okay. It says, And the seed fell among thorns, which represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure. You know what a lure is, don't you? Any of you ever do that? Beautiful art of fly fishing. And you just throw it out there, you know, you, you have a, a, a wet line or a dry line. And, and depending on what you're doing, and you, you, you see that fish rise over there underneath that bush and you can't get straight at it, so you've got to throw it upstream and let it come the whole way around. And what you're trying to do is put it over his sight because you reckon, because they, they see like a fish eye, it has to pass their field of view. And you're trying to bring that lure over their field of sight and spontaneously they'll rise for it. They, they just think it's what it is and they rise for it and they take it. They don't study it, they just take it because they're convinced that what's just past their line of view is what they want. And so they rise for it and you call them, you, 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 you take them. He says, the devil's sitting there and God wants to prosper you and he wants to bless you and he wants to take you from down here to up there and he wants to use you. He wants you to find your purpose and your destiny and your goal. He wants you to fulfill your life and have the joy and the wealth that only he can give you. And he says, and there you know it, you're sitting there and, and the other fella is fishing you and waiting for you to rise for you. He says, well, this is what I want, this is what I need. And you, as you said, you, you have a relationship with God the lure of wealth so no fruit is produced because you spend all of your time now in the pursuit of this and uh, uh, let, me, let me the seed cast in the weeds is a person who hears the good news but the weeds of worry the illusion about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard and nothing comes of it. So, all three of those things could, uh, can be related to like the worry of life. Don't worry because of money. Well, as I said, the guys that, that work hard, they can sleep at night, but the guy who accumulates is lying with his eyes open wondering who's trying to steal it on me. And, and, and the desire for the message, that's what you relate to. So it's yeah. a free money win. Yeah. And, and again, please, I'm only trying to highlight them to you. I mean, I'm not telling you this. It's what he said. He said this. He said, you better watch this. And before anybody starts taking off you, another, another, I'll talk about that again. So I'm going to show you a money handler. Here's how you should handle what you have in your pocket. All right. Because this thing can blow up in your face. When you go down in life and, and you see these, I mean, and I knew some of these guys from the, from the, 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 the disposal, uh, bomb disposal uh, experts in the army. I thought it was the craziest career ever to, and yet it's so necessary. But they only needed to make how many mistakes? One. one. Just one. And I used to think, guys, you know, 
why would you even choose this job? I mean, I'd rather do barrack yard or something. I'd rather do, but to do this? And, and it's just, it's so lethal, it's so dangerous. I think if we really understood what we have in our pocket, what we have that we call accumulative wealth, what we're dealing with, it really is lethal. It really can hurt. It really can damage. So um, I'll leave you with that image and, and just help you to realize that when, when God is in it with you and, and you can get rid of all that stuff and you get to be in control and, and um, it becomes your servant and it doesn't become your master. And that's what it does. When you operate it from the kingdom, it serves you. You don't serve it. You change the roles and money will start serving you.